Um, yes, <laughs> nice to know. Um, so as Armin already said, I'm going to talk about a very long title. Um, this is joined with, with Janik Knappmann, Henrik Schumacher and Heiko von der Mosel and we're all in Aachen at the moment. And it's funded by loads and loads of uh, federal stuff. So if you want the access to the slides, you can just scan this QR code really quickly or uh, just write me a message, I think. That's okay as well. Okay, let's go into it. I said, let's go into it. Okay, that's better. So first I'm going to talk about knots and knot energies because this generalized integral manual curvature is in fact a knot energy. Afterwards, I'm going to talk about short time existence because we have a flow and well, uh, short time existence is kind of a thing you do for ODEs and flows. And afterwards, we're going to talk about long time existence. And this projected gradients thing will be important, but let's skip it now. Okay, knots and not energies. First question, what is a knot? Obviously, that thing is a knot. So you t take a piece of rope, you tie a knot in it, and you're done. On the other hand, mathematically, I say a knot is an embedding from A mod Z, so let's say the unit circle, into Rn. And how are these two notions related? So first of all, let's lose this reality stuff with thickness and so on. Let's replace our knot by a line, which is roughly in the same shape. Okay, now the problem with this line is I still can take an arbitrarily smooth transformation to map this knot here into a straight line. So they are not really interesting knots. So to cover that problem, let's close this thing up. Now it's much harder actually to deform this thing such that it gets uninteresting. Okay, and for the record, just, just, just let's lose all of the reality and stick to lines in Rn. Okay, now I talked about what a knot is. And I already kind of teased along why we talk about different knots and interesting knots. So when are two knots the same or considered the same? We're talking about knot classes here. And then, well, we say they're the same if they can be transformed into one another via ambient isotopies. And that's a very big word and I'm not going to talk about what that really is. I'm just going to give an intuition. So. The basic thing is we want to deform one thing into the other without two things. First of all, we don't want to pass strands through each other. So if you look here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I hope so. Otherwise in the left corner, we don't want that. We don't want the strands to uh, pass through each other. So, I mean, you have a knot and you have two strands of this knot. You can't do this in general. And so we don't allow that in our setting either. The second one is maybe less obvious. Um, second one is I have a knot and if you have a real knot, you have a piece of rope and you have a knot in it and you pull it tight, it will stop at some point because well, there's this thickness and so on. But with a line, you don't have that. I mean, you can just take this knot and make it smaller and smaller and it's gone. And this thing kind of seems different than this one, topologically speaking. So we don't want that as well, uh, want, don't want that either. Okay, so basically we want to not be the same, to be the same if we can take a piece of rope, tie this knot into, uh, tie our knot into one thing, glue the ends together and just push it around until we have the second configuration. Good enough for me. Okay, now I talked about two knots being the same and it turns out it's not really that simple to prove that two knots are different. Um, so there's this classical knot theory, which is comparably old and um, much too complicated for me because it's algebra and I don't do algebra, um, which has all these invariants and so on to uh, distinguish knots. I can't do that. But uh, in geometric knot theory, which is what we are doing now, we have not energies. Not energies are a way of assigning 
some energy number to a, to a given configuration of a knot. And we are dividing our different knot types or knot classes by infinitely high energy walls. So you can't change from one knot type into the other, that is by passing strands through each other, for example, without the energy exploding to infinity. Let's make this a bit more precise. A knot energy is a function that is finite on all smooth knots. That's a, uh, a sensible assumption because we want to work with something that approaches infinity when the arguments uniformly approach a curve with a self-intersection. Ah, oh, this statement is so long. Okay, once again, one strand, second strand, and as soon as they start, uh, as they are in risk of touching, our energy should explode. Okay, and lastly, we want our energy to be bounded below because that's just nice to have for thickness of variations and so on. Okay, now I showed you two things that should not happen. I said something about passing strands and in the not uh, class thing, uh, in the not class slide, I told you about pull tight. Do not energies prevent pull tights? They do not in general, sadly. So we have another um, condition just so, which is just called tight. Tight knot energies penalize pulling knots tight. So now we can't pull a knot tight with finite energy anymore. That's better for reasons. Okay. So why I'm telling you all this? Well, first of all, because it's cool. But second of all, because this very long name I told uh, that was in my title, the generalized integral manual curvature is such a knot energy. So this was introduced by Simon Blatt and Philip Reiter, which are both in the audience at the moment, I think. Well, and um, let's get into it. So we have some parameter, parameters, P and Q, and then absolutely continuous curve, gamma. And then the generalized integral manual curvature of this curve is defined by the triple integral along the curve with respect to the Hausdorff measure, so we don't care for reparameterizations. Re and we integrate over one over r to the pq of x, y, z. And this omnis r pq x, y, z is this fraction here. So we have the three differences in the numerator to the power p. And then we take the wedge product of two of the differences. Actually, it does not matter which. And take it to the power q. If you don't know the wedge product, just imagine n is equal to three and you have a cross product and everything is nice. Okay, that's some formula. Okay, well, what do we do with it? Let's take our three points. And then these three points have a unique circle going through them. If they are collinear, you have a circle with an infinite uh, finite radius, but don't worry about that. Okay, and this circle, it has a diameter. Obviously we can call this diameter r, um, no, for historic reasons, it was first the radius and now it's the, the diameter. And so it's still called R. And this diameter is actually R11 of X, Y, and Z. And so we have this formula for the diameter of a circle through three points. And what uh, Simon and Philip did is they decoupled the exponents of the numerator on the deno and the denominator. And they got a big family of uh, energies. So actually there was an energy called integral manual curvature beforehand, which had just P equals to, P equal to Q. And so had a very much smaller range to work with. Okay. So we want to do a gradient flow. And if you're simple minded you, for gradients, you need to have a Hilbert space because a gradient is something that is a direction and something somehow a differential at the same time. So for that, you need a way of identifying this stuff. I mean, you can generalize it, but to have it really rock hard definition, bachelor's level, you need a, a Hilbert space. Okay, and it turns out we have a space which is associated to our energy, and sometimes it's a Hilbert space. So let's take P in on this beautiful interval, two thirds Q plus one and Q plus two thirds. Don't worry, P will always be from this very same interval and will boil down to seven thirds and eight thirds in a minute. And Q is bigger than one. And then our energy is associated with this fractional subalar space here. 
So this looks quite ugly, but it's somewhere between one and two. So the differentiability. And uh, the integrability is still Q. So this is another result by Simon and Philip. And what is the fraction of subload space again? Well, we usually write these as WK plus SQ. So the K is an integer part. And this WK plus SQ is actually a part of WKQ. So it's a subspace. And the subspace is characterized by having a finite seminorm. And the seminorm I wrote down here. So you take the highest weak derivative that you have and take a difference quotient with a numerator to the Q and the denominator to something else. And you integrate twice over it. And you take this whole thing over, uh, to the one over Q for normal reasons. And I mean, if you're reminded uh, of folder spaces, that's exactly the right idea. So these things kind of fill in the gaps between subleft spaces. Okay, the seminorm is called Jagliado or Slobodetsky seminorm. And it will pop up again, so maybe keep it in mind. Okay, I promised a Hilbert space. So let's give you a Hilbert space. You may remember for subleft spaces, for Q equal to two, you have a Hilbert space. And the very thing, the very same thing applies to subleft Sobodetsky spaces, so fraction subleft spaces. Our Hilbert space then boils down to W3 to uh, three halves P minus two, two. Still over closed curves. And because that's such a long thing, we call it H for Hilbert space. Okay, now our not energy was supposed to blow up if things, you know, crossed. So we can't really have non-injective curves with finite energy. At least some non-injective curves will have infinite energy. So let's restrict to injective curves. So we call U the subset of injective and regular curves. Regular is a very overused word in mathematics, if I'm honest. But here it means that the curves have a positive speed. So, you, I mean, you never stop running along the curve. Okay, and because generalized integral Mayer curvature is again such a long word, I tend to stumble along, uh, stumble over it. Let's just call it EP and be done with it. And there's actually another upside because the method I'm going to uh, show you is actually quite easily can be used for other energies. So maybe it's quite good that it's just called EP because then it's a template and you can maybe use it again. Okay, so I spent some time, oh, 13 minutes, talking about the setting. So what actually, what, what is what we want to do? We want a gradient flow. So we want a solution to this equation. We have a family of curves. So gamma depends on two parameters. The first one, which will be called X or U, will be uh, the parameter which says along at which point we are along the curve. But these curves will flow in time. So T is the time parameter. So the curves as a whole will deform over time. And this time is what we dif differentiate by. And it's supposed to be equal to minus the gradient of the energy at our curve, of our curve. So this is a gradient flow. If you don't know gradient flows, these things are the, uh, are the flows that decrease the energy locally as quickly as possible, or at least at, uh, along the fastest route. Okay, and as an initial curve, we just take something sensible, injective and regular was this thing. Okay, and because actually our knot energy is a tight one, we preserve the knot class because we can't pull our knots tight and we can't cross our strands, so, the basic idea is you give me a knot, it may be quite ugly, as long as, in, as, long as, it, is a, as it is in our subler space, I can give you back a better knot. Better meaning here lower energy. Well, that's what I claim, but I still have to prove it. Okay, so here's an example, which uh, my colleague Henrik programmed because I can't do numerics at all. So we start with this quite ugly curve. Um, it's, it does not seem to be an optimal shape. I mean, this thing here just goes through this thing here and you could just pull it out. And if you let the flow run, it's just exactly what it does. So 
So nice. We started with a quite ugly curve and ended up with a very regular trefoil. So actually this thing is not the flow I just showed you beforehand. So this does not fulfill the equation I just showed you. It's something which is uh, even from an analytic point of view, a, a pro an, ap an approximation, but we will actually show long time existence for this approximation and not for the flow itself because I couldn't do the first thing. But let's forget that for a moment. I want to talk about what we, um, what I want to show. So we take a sensible initial curve. Then we have a unique classical solution mapping the circle times zero, time, uh, zero infinity. So for all positive times <coughs> into our n, which solves our flow equation, which is basically the one you just saw as stating the problem. But not quite. So there's this S here, which I snuck in. This is the thing which, uh, which differentiates between the thing I showed you and the flow I showed you, so the video. Okay, and we have a bunch of additional uh, things that we get out of this. We have that our time dependence is C11. Actually not C11 log, C11 per, uh, period because we can just get nice bounds for the uh, Lipschitz constant of both gamma t and its time derivative. And for all points along our pre-image, so the, for all points along the circle, we have that the tangent of the curve at that point has the same length, independent of time. So we always run through our curve with the same speed, independent of what time we're at. Okay. How to prove that? Well, as I said, for flows, you start with short times existence usually. And seeing as this thing I showed you was basically no DE. Well, not basically, it is an ODE in the Hilbert space. So the first thing that comes to my mind is the Picard Lindelof theorem. If you are if you started in France, maybe it's called the Cauchy Lipschitz theorem, but they're the same. Okay. So let's restate a very, very simple version of that here. So we have a an operator A mapping from a ball around Z with radius R into our Hilbert space itself, which is Lipschitz continuous. And then differential equation, U dot of T is equal to A of U of T. So this is a very simple differential equation with the initial value as the center of the ball. This thing has a unique so short time solution. This is what may possibly all of you know. What a few people fewer may I know is that you actually can bound the existence time. So if you have an upper bound for your right-hand side and you know the Lipschitz radius, so the radius where your right-hand side is Lipschitz, then you can bound the existence time from below simply by R over M, which is quite beautiful, I think. So it's sensible. I mean, if you make the radius where your curve is not, where your function is nice, bigger, you ex expect longer existence times, and if you allow it to change more quickly, meaning the right-hand side gets bigger, you expect shorter existence times because you can run to the edge of the circle faster or ball. So you can find this, for example, in a book by Carton, which is not the Carton functional Carton, but his son, I think. Okay, so can we use this? And the answer is yes, we can. Otherwise I wouldn't have told you. So our energy is in fact C11 log and we can estimate our constants. They depend on some stuff. First, let me explain what this Bilipschitz constant is I mentioned here. So the Bilipschitz constant is basically the infimum over the difference quotient. So we have gamma of x minus gamma of y divided by x minus y. But we have here the periodic distance because our pre-image is a circle, so it wouldn't really make sense to take the uh, distance on an interval, but we have to take the distance on the circle. Okay, so let's take a look at it. The radius, where our energy is C11, depends only on P and one over the Bilipschitz constant. And as I indicated by this little arrow above that thing, the uh, dependence of the Bilipschitz constant or one over the Bilipschitz constant is non-increasing. And something similar holds up for the upper bound for our right-hand side. It still depends on P in whatever fashion. I mean, we don't uh, vary P for the moment, so that's okay. And it, it depends non, 
decreasingly on one over the Lipschitz constant and the semi-norm. You remember this double integral over this difference quotient? Okay, and now we plug in Pika Lindelof. And then it uh, turns out that our flow exists at least up to time, depending only on P, one over the Lipschitz constant, and the Gagliardo semi-norm, both of the initial curve. And you see this dependence is non-increasing for both of them. Very nice. So if we had a way of controlling these two things, let's say by the energy, we could just start a flow and these things would remain bounded because the energy goes down because of the flow. And then we could restart our flow and we have an even longer existence time when in doubt. And I mean, we would have a long time existence, we're done. Very nice. And it nearly works. So for curves parameterized by arc length, we actually have that both one over the Lipschitz constant and the Gagliardo semi-norm are bounded above by something which depends on the energy and non-decreasingly non so. So that's very, very good. And it's a result by Simon and Philip as well. It's the same paper. It's always the same paper. Uh, okay, so the catch is this parameterized by arc length thing because along the flow, I have no idea what happens to the uh, tangent, to the length of the, length of the tangent. So how do we get around that? The answer is, of course, this projected gradients, this ominous S, which I wrote in the index. So this idea of projected gradients can be found in a book by Neuberger called Sopolov Gradients and something else. And it's a very basic idea, actually. So you take two Hilbert spaces, H1 and H2. <coughs> Sorry. An open set U tilde, which is a subset of the uh, first Hilbert space. And two functions, one called E for energy, mapping U tilde into R, and one S for constraint, mapping U tilde into the other Hilbert space. And if they're both Frechet differentiable, we can write down the following. Time derivative of u is supposed to be minus gradient s, so this ominous gradient s, u of u of t, and this is defined as the projection onto the null space of the differential at point u of t, so the differential, sorry, the differential of s at point of u of t, and this is applied to the gradient of the energy at the point u of u of t. This sounds terribly complicated, but it has a very good reason to do so. Because if we now plug in our u of t, assuming it, it exists at all, and, and if we plug, plug u into our constraint s and take the time derivative, we can just use the chain rule to write the first line. And then we plug in the definition and see that we apply the differential at point u of t to something which is projected onto the very null space of that same, same thing. So this is zero. So assuming everything is smooth enough, we have to, that the constraint is preserved along t for all times, at least for all times where u actually exists. Okay, so now we want to choose a constraint that preserves our parameterization so that for example, we can start with an arc length parameterization and be done with everything. But of course, there's the problem that we now have a new right-hand side. So does this thing still exist? And it turns out if our, our original energy is nice enough, so the same as before, and if our constraint is C11, C11 log and the differential at our starting point has a right inverse, let's call it y, then our right-hand side is local Lipschitz. And we even have the bounds we needed. So we, you may, might remember we, re, we needed the Lipschitz radius, so the radius where our right-hand side is Lipschitz, and we need an upper bound for our right-hand side. And the upper bound is actually quite easy because our projected gradient is, as, a, the, name, as the name states, a projection. So we can just estimate the norm of the projected gradient by the usual gradient 
And assuming this was nice enough to start with, which it was in our case, we have an upper bound still. The radius is a bit more complicated. So you have this uh, conjunction of functions and so on. And it's a bit more involved, but in the end, it turns out you can estimate Lipschitz radius as well. And this Lipschitz radius depends on the, the norm of the differential of the constraint, the norm of the inverse of the differential of that constraint, the Lipschitz constant of the uh, differential of the constraint, all at point x, x0, and all these dependencies up to here are non-increasing. So this is important because we plug stuff into each other and sometimes we have reverse monotonicities and so on. And at the end, we want all this stuff to depend on the energy in a nice fashion. So everything turns out very nice. Okay, and lastly, we have dependence on the original radius where our energy is C11. And of course, this depends is the other way around. If your radius, if your ball gets bigger where everything is nice, for the original energy, it probably will get bigger for the new right-hand side. Okay, and then our existence time, or at least our lower bound for the existence time, is just this m over r, uh, sorry, r over m. And so we have this dependency on the energy and all the stuff the radius depended on. And now we, of course, need to kind of take all of that into consideration and bring it to terms of the energy. And this works if we take the logarithmic strain constraint, which was introduced in a paper by Sebastian Scholtes, uh, Henrik Schumacher, and Max Wadetsky. It's on the archive. And this logarithmic strain thing is a function from our set of sensible curves. Do you remember? So the Sobler space with injective and regular curves into another subtler space. So this is the same differentiability as before, just minus one. We lose one order of differentiability and we go into R instead of Rn, but the rest is okay. And we map gamma to another function, which in turn maps X to the logarithm of the length of a tangent. And of course, if we preserve the logarithm of the length of the tangent, we preserve the length of the tangent because, well, okay, so we have a new problem. And this is the problem where actually we saw uh, the problem we solved. So the time derivative of gamma is equal to minus the projected gradient with respect to this constraint of the energy at point gamma. And of course, we always have the sensible curve as an initial point. Okay, let's go back to our main theorem. We still needed, of course, to show all these things, so the bound for the differential and the bound for the inverse of the differential and the Lipschitz constant and so on. But it turns out for this logarithmic strain constraint, it's all very nice. It works out, it takes a few pages of calculations, but most of it is actually done in this paper already. So that's okay. And it turns out that all these things boil down to dependence on the Lipschitz constant and the uh, seminorm, which we know how to control if our parameterization is nice. Okay, and if we plug all of this together and do a few pages of calculations, few big in here being a comparatively big number, we get the main theorem, you already know. So, nice initial curve, it yields a unique classical solution to our flow equation, which exists for all times. And because we controlled the Lipschitz radius, while we were at it, we could just take uh, the Lipschitz constant as well and thus achieve our C11 bound here. And of course, we preserve the length of the tangent. That's just the idea of the constraint. So I hope now the main theorem is a bit more accessible. Okay, I think that would be a good qu uh, point for questions about the main theorem. Kind of weird having to wait longer than an actual, you know, talk in the real world because you have to type. But it seems there are none. Okay, so let me give a few more details. Ah, 
Ah, there comes there comes something. Okay, Philip is typing. Reset. Will we find the same outcome independent of the initial parameterization? I don't think so. Uh, at least not uh, totally. Because of the very next thing. So this thing is not invariant under reparameterization because we just used the uh, standard inner product on sobolev sobolevsky spaces, which is not invariant under reparameterization. Uh, so I would not expect it. And another reason why I would not expect it is the following. So we preserve a bunch of things along our flow. One thing is maybe quite clear that we preserve the length because we all preserve the tangent, tangent length. But another thing is that we preserve the barrier center. And the barrier center, pre uh, preserving the barrier center means that if I take a circle and parameterize, parameterize it very quickly at some points and very slowly at some others, my barrier center will be somewhere else as, um, as um, if I parameterize it by arc length. So I imagine that this effect may lead to at least shifting the barrier center if I take another parameterization. But actually, I haven't done any experiments. I wouldn't know how, to be honest, because that's more or less Henrik's domain. But I hope this answers your question. Maybe. We'll see, hopefully, in a few weeks. Thank you. OK, maybe a few other supplementary effects before I release you. Um, for all gradient flows with sufficiently nice right hand side at least, we have that the energy is either strictly decreasing or constant. That's just a th an, an effect of uniqueness in ODEs because assuming you got constant, that you stop decreasing at some point, then you have that right hand side is zero and differential equation with right hand side zero is solved by the constant solution. And by uniqueness, you had to be the constant solution all along. So either strictly decreasing or you're already in a critical point or in a projected critical point in our setting, which is not quite clear what that really means. And now two things. Actually, there's a quicker way of proving long time existence than I just showed you, but it's not that much quicker and it does not control the Lipschitz constant of the time derivative. So we get a bit less of regularity. And as I maybe announced earlier, we have these techniques carry over to other stuff. So this one is a very cheap example because the tangent point energy is a very similar construct to the integral manual curvature. So it's very closely related and it's not, so, not that surprising that the result carries over. But I think the technique can be used for other, method, uh, other energies as well. And maybe not even limited to curves. It may Maybe it will work on surfaces, who knows? That would be interesting. Okay, so to summarize, the real gradient flow for our energy exists for a finer time if our initial curve is sensible. And if we modify our curve a bit, uh, sorry, not the curve, if we modify the flow a bit, our uh, flow exists for all times, at least all positive times. So what's left to do? We now know that this flow exists for all times, but we don't know what it really does at infinity. So you have subconvergence in weaker norms, in all weaker norms in a sense, but whether you have real convergence or whether these points where you subconverge to are actually um, critical points or something like that, I just don't know yet. And of course, um, by taking q equal to 2, we have made a huge restriction. 
So one may think about the non-Hilbertian setting where there are sensible uh, expands to the notions of gradient flow. I mean, there's this whole book by Ambrosio, Gigi, and Savare, who actually did that in uh, metric spaces, so a lot less structure. So there's a lot of open space there. And with that, I think I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you. So the floor is open for questions, remarks, comments. Let's see if somebody's typing. Okay, there's one by Simon, maybe via the microphone. Yeah, that's much easier. So thanks for the nice talk. What do you expect to hold in the non-Hilbertian case, so for classical manga curvature? Well, um, what's even the notion of gradient you would use there? So there's this thing uh, called uh, duality mapping, which is a um, generalization of the Ries isomorphism, so which just maps the uh, Banach space, a Banach space into its dual space. And you can use that to define a notion of gradient and this thing is well defined for subler spaces. But to have it trivially carry over, you would, would need that thing to be Lipschitz continuous, at least locally. And it's globally Lipschitz continuous if and only if your Q, Q is at most, one, at most two. Now the problem is we had this C11 lock condition for our energy and this thing only works if Q is at least two. So uh, <laughs> I tried to do that in my master's thesis, but uh, it that did not work out at the moment uh, and maybe I should try it again. But at the moment, I don't know how to tackle that thing, maybe with monotone operators or something like that. Yeah. But it would be even questionable to carry over the techniques of the, um, of the projection and so on, because Hilbert spaces yeah. have this much structure, this much structure which yeah. I actually use. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. Wolfgang, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, maybe I ask one. So if we are converging, yeah. So what, what is the limit? So uh, you mean is, is a critical point of E? Yeah. E. Sorry. If, if if this flow converging, convert, yeah. So is, what is the limit? We don't know that the flow converges. Yeah. If, if converging. So. If the flow would converge, we would hope that this thing converges to a, a critical point. So, but uh, actually, it's difficult also difficult to prove. So, it's just that the projection is zero, it's not a critical point. Yeah, so that, that's another point. Um, if this thing were not projected, there would be no critical points. Um, yeah, but then, then, then my question is what does this mean? So, okay, uh, that's, yeah, that's a I, question I've thought about, and I have not come up with a really good answer, to be honest. Yeah, I, this is quite critical, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no <laughs> problem. Um, I, I, otherwise, I can project to give the, another projection, then prove this convergence. But the projection actually has no meaning, so then, so you should have some meaning for the projection. So, what I like to think is that this projection takes away. Um, reparameterization. I mean, in a way it does by definition of this constraint. So it would only allow, so we would have a critical point in the sense that we only allow things that really change the curve, the shape of the curve, but not the parameterization. Okay. But this thing is so hand wavy that I have been unable to prove that. And yeah, that's that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay. It's a very good question. <laughs> I yeah, thought yeah. about it long and hard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Any other question?
okay, this seems not to be the case, then uh, it's just the best Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. It was a great pleasure to be here.